um, we'll just introduce, actually this topic is one of the uh, one of my favorites, we're actually trying to do something like this several, several years ago um, uh, in, in a different context, but uh, at least I think now this year is appropriate for many reasons. Um, and especially in this weekend, as you know, which we have been expecting for several months, and uh, we will have, we have a lot to talk about. So um, we don't want to, uh, don't d delay it further. Um, uh, thanks, of course, also to Abuna Pavlos for joining us. He always encourages us and gives us his wisdom. We're trying to ask him to uh, share in one of the lectures, but because uh, of his humility, uh, you'll have to bear with us uh, for, for the time. Um, as you know already, the topic we said that we were speaking about in this topic, mainly leadership, if you didn't understand from the catchy title. Uh, so w someone once said that the essence of leadership is going out ahead to show the way, and thus the person will see more clearly, so they will lead others. So we'll talk about five uh, five lectures about different points we call them about the ABC's of leadership and uh, the lectures will basically be as follows so we'll talk about today and this evening the uh, Christ is the model example for all leadership and this will apply to uh, not people in only in executive positions uh, but also uh, as within the family it's leadership within the family, within the church, within the workplace, within the school, within life in general. Christ's model, is, as we'll see in a short while, how he's the model that leads us, as we just sang a few moments ago, uh, and how we also will take that characteristic of his to lead others to his kingdom. Then tomorrow morning we'll speak about how, what are the characteristics and the heart of the leader, and that will be be the way. And then uh, seeing the way, which is the vision, it's actually one of the most important uh, lectures of all of them because what characterizes the strongest leaders is actually the vision. Uh, even more than speaking, even there are many leaders, they didn't speak much. Like the Holy Virgin Mary, for example. We don't have a sermon recorded from her except for the praise that she says and declares in the Gospel of St. Luke. But her leadership for all of humanity uh, is a model for all of us. Um, and uh, we'll talk about discipleship and spiritual leadership, how we share the way with one another. And then finally, uh, effective leadership and some characteristics. Most people, especially when you attend conferences on leadership or read many books, and there's many of them out there, Abuna and I were uh, <laughs> struggling through uh, how to select because actually, it's not just for one conference or a subject for one lecture, but uh, it, it, we were thinking even in the future of doing a series for our servants, for our uh, future leaders. Um, uh, in, on different aspects of leadership. And I'm sure, I don't know, you probably already, maybe in your work, when your school have taken Abuna David, uh, when we were in college, he took, there's a whole course on uh, leadership. So hopefully he will share uh, some of the gems from that. Um, so as we are accustomed, we have a short video that will introduce this lecture, uh, and then hopefully there will also be some discussion uh, afterwards and questions.
Um, it's very motivational. They have a motivational. You want to like? like you think I think we can rule the world after <laughs> you see one of those videos? Uh, but we'll begin. We'll speak about Christ as the model for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Rum God, Amen. May the Lord bestow upon us His grace and His blessing, now and ever into the ages of all ages. Absolve me, Amen. So Christ, He said, as we heard a few moments ago, I am the way the truth and the life. And he is the model for all leaders. And many times, in many books, that's, uh, even though, uh, like I mentioned, we, we were looking through a lot of these books and courses, you'll find bits and pieces <laughs> or traces of Christ as the model leader. And in this time, we just want to reorient to see how much do we really use Christ as the model. Um, we'll focus on three points. We'll speak about the absence of good leaders, which the video hinted towards. The world is always in need of more leaders. We'll talk about Christ as the model. And then finally, the calls for us uh, and how we identify and recognize and respond to the call that God asks for us. Because some people have a uh, question mark or they're in the preparation stage where they've heard the call but sometimes you forget it so the, the last point uh, will be hopefully a, a good source for us so the absence of good leaders the world is craving for good leaders not just now as you know we are in in the age in in in, in politics in this next week right um, one of the uh, experts once said, at the heart of America is a vacuum into which self-anointed saviors have rushed. And always actually, no matter, in, in most of the elections, when I ask people, who are you going to vote for? Or they ask us, usually, they're not, there's a lack of motivation for some people. Some people are very eager and they will voice their opinions very loudly. But in general, Americans generally, at least the ones we interact with, they're not happy. Like we're waiting for leaders that we read about, that we heard about, that we that we experienced uh, or heard, and waiting for someone to take that position. And even when we think we found them a few years later, <laughs> we see well, maybe it's not what we thought. I'm not saying anything about one party or the next, but a general trend. And even when you read in the histories, you'll find, in the, even in American history, like the, the, the love and the passion and the, uh, for the, the leaders of, of a nation were much stronger years ago than uh, maybe today. Also, we find in religion, as Christ told us himself, that the harvest is truly great, but the labors are few. Uh, so, <clears throat> we find always even a need in our churches for strong leadership. Not just for the priests, but even among in the ser services, not just even in the Sunday school, but as a whole. As a whole. So, <clears throat> we find, uh, ask any priest <laughs> if we need servants, they will tell you, not just one or two. Like, we need teams. Sometimes we are lamenting about the team uh, of leadership. Uh, someone was telling me in one of the other uh, countries, Abuna, all he has to do, if he, there's one of the youth going astray, he has a team. He calls on that team, they go <laughs> and they work with him until they can bring them to the church and prepare them to sit with Abuna. Uh, that doesn't mean Abuna doesn't go out. But he has a group <laughs> that he can uh, call on to uh, help to get uh, the, the lost sheep. In businesses, you'll find uh, how many executives are uh, exe people working in the business field? So, the corporate world, corporate America. It's very good. It's not, not everyone is medicine. That's okay. <laughs> and then, what, what about what about uh, ser how many people are serving uh, in their church, either Sunday school or? Okay, very good. Just because sometimes, you, okay, very good. And some people are shy to say what they do. <laughs> what they do. Um, <clears throat> it's okay. That's okay. Hopefully by the end. <laughs> so now we'll say something very important for you to grasp. Uh, also in the, in the world, we need uh, leaders in the home 
which the Bible tells us that the righteous man walks in his integrity, his children are blessed after him. The leadership begins uh, even when you look in the scriptures at the very heart in the house. And Eli, God had punished him because although he was very righteous, but he didn't struggle in order to rule his family or to speak. He was shy in front of his own children to direct them in the way. As the, the scripture says, that they made his, son, the, his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. And God was asking him uh, in order for that type of leadership. Uh, Samuel also was searching, was searching for uh, the leader that God had chosen. And when the people were pushing and rejecting, you know, the type of leadership God wanted, God uh, sent Samuel in order to anoint for the king. Although Samuel was very resistant in the beginning. He felt that the people of Israel shouldn't deserve a king and should accept uh, the leadership or the, the means of leadership that, that, uh, that God had designed originally. But then God said, well, if they want a king, we'll give them a king. <laughs> and they chose for themselves. As you know, the, one of uh, the story of Saul and David, and we will speak more about that uh, in the rest of the few days here. Uh, even David, David struggled uh, with his own family, uh, but in a righteous struggle. We, sh we see the, the example of how this was uh, the way that because he was struggling for the unity of his family and the family of all uh, of all Israel at the time, or the whole church. Uh, some of the greatest leaders can conquer nations, but they even struggle at home. Uh, one of the famous, we were reading about John D. Rockefeller, as you know, very successful in his uh, business. Uh, uh, he was a tycoon and, you know, also a great philanthropist, but he had struggled his whole life in order to restore the relationship with his own daughter. So, and many of the great leaders, they have this struggle, which uh, is actually a mark. The greatest leaders, it's, it's not the cause for their uh, difficulty at home, but actually a source sometimes driving the, the, the greatness or their own personal struggle. Uh, <clears throat> there are two trends you find in um, leadership, unfortunately not today. So now we have in the church, there's the business mentality which is entering. And it's not negative. There's actually many good things, and that's, what we, that's why we're talking about <laughs> leadership in these days. There's a spiritual leadership which we need. But there are some, and we're reading about there are some, they focus only on, uh, say, first on, let's say, business, and second on salvation. Uh, they, they, so there's an uncritical acceptance of what we need to do. Now I don't know how many chur churches, our churches, doing, but this is just a warning for us uh, in the future. So there are some churches, and that's why we're reading about some of the other churches, they only focus on, on the amount of money they're bringing in, amount, amount of people that they have, or the number of buildings that they're building, or they have the mega church model. Um, and uh, there's competition and rivalries and divisions, usually uh, mo most, most clearly in uh, the uh, Western churches uh, established here. Uh, but it's a warning for us. It's, it's a warning for us to see that we don't fall prey to this trend. Or, uh, as uh, one of the books mentioned, there's a uh, Disney World motto. So what can we do to attract people, to bring, we'll do whatever we can <laughs> to make it fun and enjoyable. Uh, it's, 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 in one sense, it's good to attract people to Christ. But we have to be very cautious about this. So, as someone said, we were transformed from the Great Commission to mission statements only. I was in one of the conferences with Christian leaders in America, and they were preparing a statement about poverty, which is very important. One of the people in one of the, a big organization, Bread for the World, uh, it, it's just focused on uh, 
providing food for poor families in America. And he said a very powerful statement, I think he was the CEO or Vice President and President, and he said, this is probably the third or fourth mission statement we have made in the past four years. But we haven't done anything to help the poor people <laughs> as a whole, as Christian. And, and his, he was very clear and very precise. In, 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 and actually, I, I was trying to, I'm not among the, the leadership, it was just replacing Sayyidina when he asked me to go, so we went. I said exactly, and we should be doing one, uh, give a few examples of how we should be responding as church. But instead what happened, <laughs> a few minutes later, they just went back to doing their mission statement. And they prepared another mission statement, <laughs> or another statement, sorry, uh, to produce from the, stress, the press. And uh, our meeting is coming up against the next meeting in, in February, and so far, very little has been done. So there are some organizations like that. We like to talk, we like to speak, we like to put image, go press release, and then actually the work was uh, very little that was produced. Or that we, they shift, there's a shift between uh, the altar to the office. Thank God, I mean, so far we don't have that. Most, most of we don't even have office hours, but there are some churches that the, the priest or the pastor, whoever, they go, office hours, leave. <laughs> most, as Satan used to tell us, his office is the car, because he's always traveling <laughs> to visit this church, this family. So, <clears throat> if we see that there's a shift between the time that we pray and in our altars at home, right, or the place, our prayer room or the place that we're sh spending much more time working uh, or even our energy in that direction instead of uh, doing uh, the, the shift so that, that God really is first. There's another Christmas, Chris, Christmas Christian business model that comes with businesses that are trying to appear to be more Christian. I don't know if you people in the business world will tell us uh, your experience. If this is, there's again, of course, some good to this, where uh, Christian leaders are actually taking the forefront and trying to make their organizations honest uh, and uh, truthful and transparent. Uh, but there are some businesses that are doing this just to attract more business, not because they necessarily believe in the values that we believe in, uh, or just taking an image that looks very good <laughs> and attractive, but the essence is lacking. Um, so this is uh, the, the direction which some executives uh, and uh, leaders have drawn attention to. Um, some of the examples that you'll find, and these are just some of the many books that you'll find, uh, and there's thousands of these out there. And, and one of the people was writing in the books, he said, they ask us to go to conference after conference on leadership, and actually it's just a part of the routine. Whereas really the effect, the effect, because if Christ is not clearly in some of the modelship that we have, it doesn't have to be that we're preaching in the office. Or, um, but really, as the model ship, you know, a few years ago, the book that came out, you know, what would Jesus do? Has anyone, we've heard of, you see the armbands and the shirts, and has anyone read the book or seen the book? There's, it's a very powerful book that was written um, over a hundred years ago, I believe. Um, but the story begins, and it's a true story, with a pastor who has this challenge to his congregation saying that I need 10 volunteers that will come after the service to, um, to join this challenge. The challenge is very simple, that in all of their decisions they make in the next year, they have to ask themselves honestly and faithfully, what would Jesus do in this situation? And, um, and they're obliged to go the whole way. Like if they think that Christ would leave their work, <laughs> they have to leave their work. They sell their company, they sell their company. If they have to, so uh, it was a very big challenge, but 10 people came, I don't remember all of them. One of the, them was like a singer, one of them was the owner of a big uh, newspaper uh, press, another one was, um, I believe in construction, there's a number of different jobs. Uh, the only one that I recall, because I read it several years ago, <laughs> it's not very fresh in my memory, but uh, the one who was singing, 
she said, I can't. She was singing in you know, different places. Wherever they hire her, she goes. So after a while, she said, I can't go to this place. I can't go to that place. Can't. She said, she went to the pastor. After, they used to have a meeting almost weekly or monthly afterwards to report on, on their progress. So by the end, she told the group, I can't stay in my work. What do I do? <laughs> so they prayed about it, and afterwards she said, I have to leave her work. She began to sing in the church only. And the church found a way to support her. The one who was running the newspaper articles, he found a problem with the uh, advertising. He said, I can't support all of these companies that are advertising in my newspaper, um, and they're not honest, reputable, Christian so he, st he started to eliminate them one by one. So his business, of course, started to, the readership started to decrease. And even the content of many of the newspaper articles, they were not Christian. So he, as the editor and owner, he had to cut it. So by the end, after a lot of prayer and reflection, he said, I had to change the whole newspaper from a regular newspaper to a Christian newspaper. <laughs> and there were very few in that neighborhood, so actually it became successful. And the stories repeat, um, the important thing is that when they took seriously Christ as leading their life, and that decision that uh, honestly it, would, it will change our life, if we were that faithful to see, well, I have to make that commitment. And they had a group, a small group of people that they were accountable for those decisions. So sometimes we have a general um, policy. <laughs> uh, then it's very, it can, it can go uh, astray. Like it can be lost in the shuffle. And we have the pressures of life or of work or of the, um, the, the you know, financial statements that come at the end or the the advisors that give us pressure say well business is not doing well we we're just talking the other day about people who work um, in uh, the restaurant industry and we were pushing them you know can you close on Sundays that you own it's not like someone's hiring you or firing you <laughs> can you close on Sundays and we beg some of them the people who are faithful and honest even to, to that uh, they, they have many stories to tell of how God blesses them because they're faithful to the commandments of God and it's a risk it's a big business risk uh, and Abuna will tell us also about how like Chick-fil-A and one of the uh, how that's their policy and they're very strict with it and look and it's a very, one of the few, uh, a few years ago, uh, one of the people who invested in uh, one of the, the restaurants in Los Angeles, he asked Abuna uh, to go and bless it. <laughs> and it's the first time I heard of, well, what is it, well, another restaurant, like it's just another. And then after we started to investigate, you know, what Abuna is going to bless it for, because we made a special prayer, uh, not just for the homes, but for this business. Um, so anyways, uh, when we began to investigate in the book about the, the owner, well, do you know his name? I don't know. It's Anyways, I was very impressed by the model, the true, true Christian. Of course, many people have different opinions nowadays, especially. We'll talk about that later. But the question is that is Christ really the model for our decision making at work or at school or at, at home? Uh, and this is, I think, what is compelling us, what compelling us. I was wondering, like, say if you're at your work, if we pulled the people around you that work with you, and we asked them, do you think that so-and-so follows or is a model <laughs> and is responding to Christ's call in their life or not? Some may be very uh, uh, dissatisfied or very angry may respond, <laughs> but it should, be, it should be clear for them. If we took the five things that we talked about, um, of course the first one is assumed, that's our lecture now, but if we took the, just some of the points, this is a summary of a summary, in each one of these there are many books written about it. <laughs> so that's why we're not going to do it justice, this is just an introduction. Uh, to them. Um, we take, we'll take the last four and we'll try to just see how Christ will be the model for these uh, uh, points of leadership. So about the character, about vision, about discipleship and some effective quali qualities. We'll see how Christ truly can be the model for us and once this is clear then we can go in detail how we can apply uh, these things for our life. So in terms of <coughs> character and heart. When Christ was leading the disciples, 
um, many times there was the pressure for him to act in one certain way and actually there was in many places an expectation uh, that he would act in a certain way and out of the challenges out of these challenges come the mark of great leadership like the great leader is not just not because he has a certain title or he's promoted or he's paid a certain salary although even he can have CEO <laughs> but re the great leaders are the ones that um, truly they affect others. They, there's an impact. There's some companies they, uh, or uh, positions that they can change from one to the next. And people uh, working under them or with them may not find much of a difference. But true leadership, it's, it's unmistakable. <clears throat> so Christ, in many of these circumstances, he says, uh, in, in one occasion, he says, don't think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. This is one of the accusations against the, the Israelites, against the Jews, and scribes and Pharisees. Why was he saying this? He didn't waste his energy <laughs> on some uh, useless arguments or discussions of it. So he said, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste <laughs> energy and time in one direction when I know. But you look to Moses and see how he already accuses you. Another example. Um, when they were challenging the Lord, he said, uh, St. Peter, he was saying, what about this man? He was speaking about St. John, who wouldn't die. So Christ tells him, look, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Basically, he's telling him, look, there's a lot of questions you're not familiar about. Don't waste your time here. <laughs> Why is that servant doing this? Or why is that person not coming to Of course, we have a motivation inside to bring all and to help whoever we can. But if we find ourselves even accusing from one disciple to the next, Christ says, look, <laughs> follow me and worry about the other things. One time St. Anthony also had that question. He's like, how come people are suffering here? And how come people are so far from? How come you reward some people who are not faithful and honest? And God told St. Anthony, look, <laughs> these questions, leave them to the side for now. Focus on your relationship with me. And, and many times, even in leadership positions or in, in, in our lives, we waste a lot of energy worrying and complaining or judging other people. So Christ had a very fine line. He didn't waste time on the demolition crew. <laughs> he was always in the building phase. phase. Um, <clears throat> And he, he prepares the disciples for this. He said, look, you, you are, I'm going to send you. They're not always going to accept you. They're not going to smile in your face. <laughs> They're not going to say, oh, what a nice and gentle and honest and good Christian. <laughs> it's the opposite. He said, you're going to go to cities. They're going to kick you out of the city. What did he tell them? He said, don't get angry. Don't write petitions. Don't go, to <laughs> go and, uh, and complain to each other about what they did to you in Lister or in Derb or whatever. He said what? Shake the dust off your feet. Go to the next city. And sometimes, and you look at the example of St. Paul, he went back into the city. <laughs> he's, not, he's not upset by it. So the, the good leader knows how to do that. Shake off the dust and continue working. Uh, we didn't, Abun and I were discussing, there's a whole section about cynical leadership and how many times the, the good and positive and forward-looking uh, leader after you get to all, comes to a problem or difficulty and it takes out all the steam. And the devil is very good at bringing us, you know, or, or, uh, as Abun Shakim used to say, like, when I see the devil coming and fighting, I know that this is the way that I must go. <laughs> so we press harder. We don't get discouraged. But all of us, we will be challenged. Believe, believe me, and you know already, especially if you reach a higher position, you know the higher that you go in the, in, or the more responsibilities that you take at work or at, at school or at church, <laughs> you'll find more people complaining or attacking or questioning you. Uh, so Christ said, this you should expect. Before Pontius Pilate, he also taught us what? That there's some times where we deal in silence. Sometimes that this is uh, where he said the energy he was it was saved for the cross, <laughs> and there was a point where it didn't mean that he doesn't defend himself. He made his defense, but afterwards, uh, there when he said what he needed to say, 
he didn't waste his time with and there's many people I'm sure at work and school or church <laughs> that there's a there's a there's a limit <laughs> so when you feel like you're really losing your yourself uh, one of the priests used to tell me in the beginning when I first ordained he told me he said there's going to come a time or you're going to get discouraged so he said, what do you do? And he said, when I do that, I leave everything <laughs> and I go. Actually, he, his church was on a mountain. He said, I go to the mountain, I go to the church, I just pray. <laughs> uh, and it was a very good reminder <laughs> for me many, many, many times. <laughs> when you see when that, that pressure comes, uh, we know where to go. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, we talked about the model of Christ or the virtuous uh, leader. This is some repetition, so we will just... Uh, then we'll go to the vision. We'll talk, as we said before, about vision. And you'll see how Christ was fixed on, on vision. There are um, a lot of things uh, to talk about uh, later on, but like I said, this will just be a sum summary. The mission statement of the Lord, does anyone know where it comes or where, it's, where He uh, delivers the mission statement? In, in the ministry of the Lord Christ, what would you say is the mission? If you, am I not supposed to ask questions or give you all the answers? <laughs> does anyone know where it comes? You think in the beginning or the end? It's an easy question. The mission statement, if Christ has a mission statement, and He does actually, I mean, he, it's very clear, it's a prophecy that comes and there was a time when he was invited to a synagogue to preach very early on in his ministry and the custom was that you'd open the scriptures and you read a passage just like we do today and you explain and if there's a guest rabbi or teacher or famous preacher they would do that and they would preach and sometimes the, the teacher would be able to select the reading so, is it getting more familiar? <laughs> so Christ enters, and he, in the Gospel of Luke, He takes this passage from Isaiah. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. This is the anointing, that's why He's called Christ. He has anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I, I'm sure for us, and sometimes we don't think in this way, but there are verses that are very clear and some people take as their mission statement. Actually, I, I should probably correct and say, reveal to them their mission statement. In the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope usually has a custom, I don't know how old it is, but they have a custom of taking a verse or two or a statement as their mission <laughs> for the time which God gives them to be Pope in that uh, era. I know uh, our bishop, he also uh, took uh, one verse uh, to bring all people perfect in Christ. And everybody in the diocese knows that this is the model. <laughs> Sometimes when we want to, a new project or new work, we will fit this <laughs> in the right place to say, this is how our project, our service, our retreat, whatever it is, is going to be in line with the vision of uh, our leader, our father. And the same, we hope, in the new... <laughs> uh, in the, in the new uh, era of the Pope, our Father, the Father, Father, and Shepherd of Shepherds, that also he will take a very clear vision that God reveals. And many times on, on the day of ordination, or at some point in his ministry, God will make it very clear. Usually it's in the beginning. Like say you're taking a new position, or you're going to marry someone uh, new, and the, uh, the time comes, maybe a few verses for that work, for that task, for that lifelong commitment will be clear. And it should be. Like, there are many verses about love and family, <laughs> but imagine how every family has, this is our model, this is our, 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 our vision, what God reveals to us for our life. And many times when we get weak, or we have problems, we go to that and we turn to that and we said, Oh, Christ, you told me this. You revealed to me this. It gives us that motivation. And we'll talk about that too, how leaders, in, um, especially in 
new positions, uh, when they when they take on, say, a corporation, I know many of you will not be CEOs, but who knows, maybe you'll start your own organizations on the side after, you know, medicine or law or whatever <laughs> you do in the accounting of course <laughs> that that you will have on the side as the side project that will save the world like you can you can do accounting and uh, dentistry and medicine and all of these things but maybe you also have another project which many leaders actually had not that you can't save the world through your work but maybe God also is preparing you for something else there's one of the ladies, actually, she used to work at a, um, as, what was the name, title of her position? She was a secretary, an administrator for a person. Basically, you know how, like, uh, the president has one secretary, the, the president, the main presidential secretary? She did that for a very big um, executive in, in Hollywood. And she, was, she would organize very big events that uh, bring in a lot of money and income. That's, that was her job, like dinners and uh, uh, all of these things. But God had um, revealed to her she came across very poor children in the Los Angeles area. I'm sorry to give too many examples about Los Angeles, but <laughs> this is what I'm most, most familiar with. And uh, she went to places where she had heard many families in just in Los Angeles, they don't have enough money to pay for shoes for their children. And she was so distraught by this. She said, like, maybe in Africa and third world countries, but in, in America, in the 20, at that time, the 20th century, and 21st century, and they don't have... So she started her own organization on the side. <laughs> and actually now, I don't know how, how big it is, but it's, it's very well known. So she actually used the talents that she was organizing for her boss <laughs> and began to organize events for her charity which actually reached uh, we found about it through the radio was, uh, she had, there was an announcement on Christian radio and public radio uh, for this and and to see that I remember asking her well how did you get this she said many people when they hear about my story they want to just join and they want to help in, in, in any way they can and I encourage them but I tell them the same thing that God may be calling you for something else Yes, you want to follow, and we need your help in this project. But to copy just what I have done, maybe it's preventing you from discovering and from following what God is actually calling you to do. And this is what the best leaders will um, do. For Christ, the vision... <clears throat> that he has was always towards the cross. So someone said when I ask in the beginning or the end, in the beginning Christ puts his model. At the end of his uh, ministry, when Christ is facing the cross, he reminds and emphasizes his vision so that it's clear for all the people in the organization, if you will. Um, so the cross was not, as we know, not just for Christ, but for all. It was for all humanity before and after his position. Could you imagine like in your position, in your work, or in your career, that you will be a model for people coming after you? Maybe by, we say like in the Senexar, if, if you live the good Christian struggle, become a model of holiness. In your, we, I don't know how many dentists we have in the Senexar, but maybe we need one. <laughs> right? So imagine... Uh, like even I say some people from certain uh, diseases they have certain diseases that will find that I think for every major disease like not just cancer or multiple sclerosis or that God is searching for saints among all of those so that when anyone gets afflicted with that disease or illness that they will have a saint that will support them and give them a, a good Christian model and we say well they didn't have this disease in the 5th century well, that's why we need saints in every generation. That's why the, sa the saints are there to give us that motivation for leadership. They were leadership in the 3rd, 4th, 5th century. But we need today, in 21st century, in Chicago, in New York, in Los Angeles, uh, Indiana, <laughs> in, in, in our school in Indiana. And they celebrated a few years ago the first saint uh, from Indiana <laughs> in the Catholic Church. And they have a building for her. Uh, she was like a nurse, uh, and then she became a nun. Um, 
Saint Liam, I believe it is. But anyways, whenever anyone is sick in the school, they go to the, the clinic, and the clinic is named after her. So, uh, to see how they were very excited that they have a saint now from... So, I think in, in Chicago, in Michigan, in Ohio, we need saints in, to go in the Senexar from... Uh, this area, not yes in Egypt, but also we need outside of Egypt. <laughs> um, so this is the vision that Christ would emphasize about the cross when he would say, <clears throat> when people tried to get him away from the vision, he was very Saint Peter, one of the. Uh, greatest of the disciples and it was very clear get behind me I know my vision I will not get distracted <laughs> from what you wish for this is this is the 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 leader right in Gethsemane when the when they're he's sweating blood and faced with the very difficult decision the leader has to accept because he knows we have to go in this direction but after Gethsemane comes Golgotha, after Golgotha comes the resurrection. And, and the good leader knows, he knows we're going in this direction and we have a cross in front of us. Who's going to take it? No. Leave the disciples, it's for me. <laughs> I carry that, I will carry this cross because I've been waiting for it my whole, my whole life. <laughs> or maybe I've been already caring about it for, carrying it for several, several years. To reach the cross, I know this is, this is, this is awaiting me. Um, <clears throat> the greater the sacrifice, the clearer the vision, the clearer the vision, the greater the leader. That's why the leaders are, are searching for sacrifice. They're not pointing to the people underneath them and telling them to carry the cross on their behalf. <laughs> like I'm sure after a while when S Simeon was carrying the cross uh, with Christ, it says, after all he's like, okay, I need it now. <laughs> yes, I shared with you for a time. <laughs> just to give you the sweetness so later on you could see and tell others how it was to carry the cross but this is mine <laughs> I'm taking it for all others like there are many people and you know them in leadership positions or you have a boss that just likes to throw give you all their work I'm many some of the worst bosses and you know, probably know from example that they don't do anything <laughs> they like to give to the people right under them, instead of training them, they give them all the work, and, and, and then they take all the credit. <laughs> right? Christ is the opposite. The good leader has the right vision. Yes, he shares uh, with, or she shares with others, and lifts them up. This is the vision of, of good leadership. Um, <clears throat> the, as we say, the, the vision should be shared from the boardroom to the restroom. So the people cleaning up even the toilets, and Amba Tomas told us a number of years ago that in his place in Anafora, he wants to make sure that the lady cleaning the toilets has the same vision as the person at the front desk or the priest that's in, in the... And this is, this is what Christ did with the apostles. Uh, and we'll talk about how we can do it but even to the end he, he before going to the cross he didn't leave them in doubt he wanted to share vi his vision of the cross what is going to happen with all so that so that no one was just surprised said oh that's what you're going to do and they, even when they forgot he came to remind them again don't you know didn't I tell you <laughs> like sometimes in reading the Gospels you say didn't the disciples know that he's gonna and he told them he's going to rise from the dead several times in the third day. And then they come in the third day it's like, as if nothing happened. <laughs> so the good leader is clarifying the vision and reminding those about uh, others about the vision. Um, <clears throat> whether it was very early on in John chapter 3, right? Very, very beginning of the ministry, <laughs> right after Cain of Galilee, or if it's at, very, at the very end with the apostles in Matthew chapter 20. Then we'll talk about discipleship. Don't want to bore you, <laughs> just go quickly. But this is one of my favorite lectures uh, also, of how Christ is asking um, us to follow Him, and how the leader has the same authority uh, as uh, St. Paul says, we'll go through all of this, we'll just give you a glimpse. Is it imitate me as I imitate Christ? So the leader in his or her uh, workplace is saying the same. Saying that I'm doing this work, but as uh, the position which God has entrusted me with, even wherever, wherever it may be, 
whatever city you may be in, and that I'm following. My, my, clear, my uh, vision is clear. And it's, it's, it's powerful and it's life-changing. Um, <clears throat> so we'll ask in this lecture some questions to think about who, who are you directing or where are you taking them? Uh, what is God asking for you? Finally, we talk about effective leadership and I think uh, I don't want to get too distracted from this uh, but Christ he gives many models of how the leader should be accessible, should be available. <laughs> they didn't have to leave too many messages for Christ, but some people couldn't reach them, right? Like Mary, Martha, and I say this after <laughs> I take a time, where yet we can't always answer the phone. In this world, we are pressured <laughs> to be always available. And media does help, but the good leader knows how to balance so that so that the phone doesn't take control of their life or Facebook or whatever, the emails even. Uh, you know that uh, when Obama became president, one of the biggest withdrawal symptoms that he had to deal with was the Blackberry. Did you hear about this? It was on the news. So he, he was so uh, uh, accustomed to responding very quickly to his Blackberry and his advisors told him, you can't do this, it's a security risk. You have to, they have to shift it to the, and in the beginning he insisted, <laughs> but after a while he listened to his uh, advisors and he had to, uh, because it's very, you can't, you're not supposed to know where the president is <laughs> and anyone could trace it, it's very difficult. So <clears throat> as, as leaders we have to know where the line is. And it's very difficult, very, very difficult, uh, especially for us as priests, <laughs> to draw that line. And some people, a lot of people are not happy. <laughs> the other day, someone called me and said, uh, uh, she couldn't believe that I answered the phone. <laughs> I said, why? She said, well, in our area, <laughs> none of the priests answer the phone. Not here, it's in another state. No one's, and, and even after I leave a message, <laughs> it may be days. I'm like, usually, I told her, usually that can happen with me too, but you just, uh, you caught me at a good time. You must have been praying. But sometimes for us as leaders, we have to know where the line comes. Or else we definitely we'll lose our time, our energy, and our focus. Uh, so we'll talk about this um, also. Um, how to express ourselves. <clears throat> in an effective way. Finally, this is, this is the last, we said one, two, three, I do the last one. What is the call to action? I have a question. <coughs> I know you told me 90 minutes, uh, w but I didn't know when it ends. What? Okay, very good. So you have like four minutes. I think we can do it in four minutes and that won't leave you too much time for questions. What? What? Yeah, but it's not my fault. <laughs> I mean, it's, your, it's not your fault, it's my fault. Um, <clears throat> are people born leaders? What do you think? Are there born leaders? To, and actually, in some of the books, there's different opinions. What do you think? Some people are born leaders. Is leadership learnable? Yes. Is it teachable? Yes, okay, that's why we have the comment. <laughs> we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be here if we said there's some people you're not born, maybe, maybe you are born, if you're not. So how do we, what's the difference? Look at Christ's leadership. Someone said, well, I wasn't born, I don't, I'm not good at speaking. Or I'm not in, born from a wealthy family. Or I find myself useless. Uh, I'm not like those other people that are great leaders. We look at Christ, when he, his model of leadership, he, they called him useless from the beginning, right? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He was not born in like New York City or in wherever. <laughs> and most of the biggest world leaders were born in unknown towns. Right? Not that Chicago's on, not everybody knows. <laughs> um, or, he, he, didn't t he didn't go to the famous schools and get the highest degrees. Actually, in the beginning, they're like, how, does he, how can we even let him teach? Where did he study? He's, he is not under Gamaliel or the other people. We don't, we don't, know, we don't have his, uh, his resume, it doesn't fit in this place. <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> he was not... And this is all in earthly terms. Of course, we know that Christ, in each one of these, He is the author. He is the wisdom, right? He is the one who gives us hope. So all of these are in worldly terms, right? Poor, definitely, He was poor. But He lived poor, He was rich, and He made others rich, right? In, in the right way. 
um, when you look at the comparison between Saul and David, because the people wanted a leader, they picked the tallest one, the strongest one, the one, yeah, that, that's a leader, that's a king, we need that guy, right? And we know from the rest of the book <laughs> what happened, right? And then when, when God calls David, we say, that he doesn't look like Saul, we're used to that. In the presidential elections for a long time, and I think this trend actually uh, died out. Like, but I remember when we were studying a number of years ago, not too long, but a number of years ago, they, they compared the height of all the president, uh, the uh, runner-ups, the people who are um, uh, running for president in the debates, like so when they come down to the final two. And they found out that the pattern was almost consistent that the taller president would usually win. <laughs> It's before technology, and now we don't even know, because we might not even meet the president. <laughs> but in that time, they would say, yeah, the taller president, whoever's taller, he's going to win. I don't know who's tall. I think it's, I'm not going to say. <laughs> but, but this trend, I think, uh, at least after they taught us, it didn't seem to match. But for a number of years, this is what they look for, the taller, the stronger, the one who's most eloquent. But actually, the best leaders are not necessarily so. Right? And God loves to flip this equation, to pick the weak, the one, the people that are not expected to win. That's why we like, especially in America, we like the underdog to win. <laughs> and God, in His way, loves to do that. That's why when He called the apostles, yes, He picked some of the educated and some of the wealthy, but He, he liked to, to, to shock, <laughs> for the shock value, <laughs> say, well, how, did, how is this guy, pre he was just catching fish the other day, right? And, he didn't, he didn't learn all the things that we, exactly. <laughs> because his success is now attributed to the Lord Christ. Finally, call to action. There are three ways that God calls us. Through the burning heart, the burning bush, and the burning house, or the city. Uh, very quickly. So the first one, the burning heart, which is the zeal that God has within us, where the passion is guiding the leadership. Not that leaders are just emotional uh, and react to anything. Those are actually very dangerous leaders. <laughs> Say, go to war, go to war. Yes, how could they do that? <laughs> or attack, attack. No, <clears throat> it's, a, it's the passion that's driving their uh, leadership. Um, that's why Christ says, I wish you were cold or hot. I need people who are zealous, 100%. So sometimes God calls us to leadership through that passion, that desire. When someone says, how come they're doing this? Why is this problem existing? It should be solved. And you find those people, after a while, um, in one of the books, there was a lady who had this passion in uh, one of the conferences, and she was saying, look at all these problems in the organization. She began to speak from that. She just spoke up once because they were asking for feedback. Because in, uh, within a month, she became the leader of the organization. <laughs> she didn't plan it. She didn't think she, she could be the, the leader. But because of her passion, her heart, God uh, called her to that. Oh, I should be doing this. The second one, which is David, the prophet, uh, as his example uh, for the same, where when Goliath, they're being oppressed by Goliath, God touches the heart of David. He said, how come, how come you're letting this guy defame the people of God and God himself? How come nobody's acting? And he had no answer. And then when he kept asking one after the next, he said, they're just waiting. How long have you been waiting for someone to respond? So then, of course, you know the story when he says, I, well, I'll go. And no hesitation. And he began to say, look what God did with, with me with the lion and the bear. And after a while, when he began, he was so persistent because his passion was very clear and God <coughs> instills him uh, and confirms that vision for him. After a while, what does he say? The people, even the king, begins to take his side. He says, nobody has this passion. You must be the one. Right? Uh, so, so, by the end, Saul says, go and the Lord will be with you. Um, okay. That's the first. 
Now we have the burning bush, which is an individual and direct call. It's different from the burning heart. The burning heart comes from within. The burning bush, it's obvious. <laughs> the, the bush is not burning. <laughs> it was a very clear call that God made directly and only to him. It's not like uh, Goliath was around and uh, there's a common problem. There was a problem of Pharaoh for many years. But because of the burning bush, there was a change. So it's a clear purpose and vision that God reveals. And even in the beginning, Moses is resistant. So he doesn't have the burning heart in the beginning. Yes, he wants the people of Israel to be saved. But he himself doesn't want to go. Actually, he gives every excuse for him not to be the one. <laughs> and God was patient with him in the end, but by the end, when he leaves the burning bush, he knows, I have no choice. I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> like, this is what God wants. This is what God wants. Um, <clears throat> And in our life, uh, depending sometimes by personality, like the, I think if you were the people that you know, the born leaders, more usually for the burning heart, usually. Not, not necessarily, but usually they fall in that category. Uh, the ones maybe uh, more in terms of trained or learned leadership, more in terms of, of this, like the, the call that God asks them, usually by a burning bush. Um, <coughs> and then finally we have the burning house or the burning city, uh, which you find a good example in Nehemiah when the city was literally burning of Israel. And he was distraught just at the messages that were happening around. And of course it's related to the first one, like his passion, his heart was for the uh, re-establishment of Israel. But the more that he heard about the burning of the city, he knew that we, we have to do something. The same for Queen Esther. <coughs> There's a delay. Uh, same, same for the Queen Esther. Yes, she had the burning heart, but at the same time, because the people of Israel were also in the same affliction. And this is, it was such a grave disaster that God needed a leader, and even He spoke, right, uh, clearly to her, saying, uh, Don't think, don't think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Uh, <clears throat> For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And sometimes it's not necessarily in her heart. Maybe she didn't have... Uh, she had the passion for her people. But it definitely didn't call her to act. And in the second case, there was no necessarily burning bush. God didn't speak through a burning bush for her. But he sent someone very clear to tell her, very clear, <laughs> in her face. You should, this is what God is calling you to do. And if you don't do it, he's going to find someone else. Uh, but really, he was telling her, you're here for this. <laughs> and, and, and God will send us the same messages and clear messages. So, uh, give you some homework to do. Um, when you ask what is God calling you to do tonight, and hopefully through the by the end of the retreat, to spend just a half an hour, oops, just spend a half an hour answering these three questions. You can do it early in the morning, you can do it late at night, you can do it in the middle of the day in the free time, but it's probably, we have quiet time tomorrow for something else. Um, but this, if you, um, sometimes when people get really stuck in their life uh, and they have to make a major decision, we try to uh, tell them to take, you know, a retreat on their own just to cover these three questions. And you'll know 10 minutes are not enough. We actually did this, I think, with the high school. Uh, so they got a little early. If you answer very three simple questions, but you want to go to them in a very deep way. Ask yourself, who is God to you? Not just in the Bible. You can start with titles of who God is. But try to go deeper, and when you say, okay, Pantrogator, God and Savior, and you, you'll go through the general titles. But then go deeper to see, really, the personality of God, <laughs> His dealing with you, 
the titles maybe that you give him and sometimes you know when you love someone very much you might give them nicknames but not in an insulting way of course because it's God but you see that even with like you have a favorite title of God there are over a hundred names and titles for God and maybe of all of them you may pick a couple that really speak to you and this is very important it's actually the most important question and the hardest one second you'll ask who are you and you could start again with the regular titles and what you do and what your degrees are but when you go deeper you'll find and discover a lot more some people will ask also to who they want to be and just wants and desires and then finally what do you think or what can you feel that God is calling you to do has already called you to do but to make it very clear if you're not sure that's exactly you keep asking <laughs> and you'll and you that time you'll spend in prayer and in and asking God what many times as leaders and we're already called like I don't think when we were younger with very young we say yeah we want to be the president of the United States everyone to be president of the United States right um, not everyone <laughs> but a lot of of course that's too late for most of us <laughs> not all of us but many of us but you see that God called you to certain things but even after he's called you to certain positions the the leader the the that God call, is still always asking okay now what's next and 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 that vision that that question you will always be asking number three um, so uh, hopefully this will give us a better perspective for us and glory be to God forever Amen.